Welcome to The Ringling, everyone, virtually. My name is Katie Nickel. I am the head of our educational programs here at the museum, and I am really delighted that you are all joining us today for a virtual viewpoint lecture uh, with Dr. Christine Keener. Uh, without further ado, uh, it is a pleasure to introduce my colleague, Elisa Hansen, who is the head of our library services, and she will kick us off today. So, Elisa. Thank you, Katie, and welcome to everybody um, to this viewpoint. Um, uh, two or three times a year, Katie is kind enough to allow the library to present uh, a program, and so we're very grateful to her for that because it's always uh, uh, a pleasure for us to do that. Uh, many of you, I can see mm. names, and I know you, and you're already familiar with the library, uh, but for those of you who have not visited the library, I would encourage you to come in and use our resources, uh, which are extensive and comprehensive. Um, we have a collection of about 70,000 titles, we have a rare book collection, which is growing and becoming more and more significant. I think we have John Ringling's private uh, collection of books uh, that uh, were in Katazan when he was living there. Uh, we have also access to hundreds of databases and subscriptions to 70 different journals and magazines. So if you come here, it's a beautiful space and, and we would love for you to use the library. So you're, you're most welcome to do that. We're located in the education building here at the Ringling. And also, too, if you ever have reference questions, you're welcome to phone or email me, and uh, I will try and answer them if you're not able to come in. So I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Christine Keener, who is the Professor of Renaissance and Baroque Art History at uh, Ringling College of Art and Design. She has her master's from Kent State University, and she is particularly qualified uh, to discuss this subject because uh, her doctoral dissertation at Indiana University was, uh, uh, the title of it was, um, Severna Roland Devotion to Florentine Art, Botticelli to uh, Pontormo. Uh, so this is a subject that she has spent years doing uh, research on. And so um, I'm sure it will be extremely interesting to us. Um, she presents, um, she has taught at Lander University and Indiana University, and she gives lectures and papers at conferences and universities and museums uh, in many different countries. So we are delighted to have you this morning, Christine, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, just unmuting myself. Um, first of all, feel free to just call me Christine. Uh, Dr. Keener sounds too much like Dr. Kevorkian. It kind of freaks me out a little bit. Um, also, I'm getting over a really horrid virus. If you live in Sarasota, you probably are aware that there's this horrible virus going around. Uh, so I'm actually presenting from home and I have a cat and Sammy will likely join us at some point during this discussion. Plus, I, I will be um, having cough drops, et cetera. So I do apologize for the quality of my voice. Um, so I have a PowerPoint because, you know, I am an art historian. So I'm going to go ahead and share that. Uh, so the title basically is on Savonarola's uh, censorship, but really more than anything, uh, it was his impact of his sermons and treatises on um, artists and how they censored their own work. Um, and to really get started with this first, we're going to talk um, quite extensively about Savonarola himself, because honestly, I love discussing Savonarola, and I don't know why normal people don't want to talk about him with me, but I've been invited to discuss him with you, so I'm very excited. Um, so we have a great quote here from Savonarola, and you'll notice that I put a asterisk after the date of 1489, because he actually got the date wrong here. Um, he was recalled to the Florentine Monastery of San Marco in 1490. Um, so I just wanted to kind of um, put that up there so we have that correction already. But you're looking at a painting of um, the Dominican monk uh, Savonarola um, by Fra Bartolomeo, one of the artists that is really closely aligned to the tenets of him. So I'm going to, I have a prepared paper, but I'm also going to talk conversationally. And feel free to just yell out my name if you have a question. My students know that I kind of get on a roll. I get so excited. And especially on Zoom, I can't see all of your faces so or your little hands if they were raised. So just scream at me, okay? 
Um, the 15th century Dominican monk, Girolamo Savonarola, profoundly influenced the art of his era during his tenure at the Monastery of San Marco in Florence. Both heralded and condemned in his own time, Savonarola continues to fascinate and perplex scholars such as myself more than five centuries after his execution on May 23rd, 1498. Existing scholarship on the frate, as he was very often recalled, locates him in one of two categories, Savonarola the prophet or Savonarola the heretical and power crazy zealot. So they're quite a dichotomy. Savonarola was born in Ferrara on September 21st, 1452. He was the third of seven children, and before he rose to prominence, his grandfather, Michele Savonarola, was the most um, well-known member of his family up until that time, and that's because his grandfather was actually the doctor to the, the Marquis of um, Ferrara. And his grandfather also was a noted author who wrote the very popular and widespread and widely used um, medical treatise called Practical Medicine, as well as several religious texts as well. The young Girolamo began his Latin studies under his grandfather, um, and then sometime in 1468, the year that his grandfather died, Savonarola, perhaps late as an homage to his grandfather, turned his attention to studying medicine at the University of Ferrara. Uh, early biographies of Savonarola attribute his religious convictions to the influence of his devout grandfather. Uh, and while the pious inclinations of Michele Savonarola certainly affected his grandson, in 1475, uh, Savonarola joined the Dominican monastery at Bologna, the monastery of San Domenico, against the wishes of his family. Uh, they actually hoped that he would continue in medicine and become a doctor like his grandfather. Okay, I always do this for all of my classes. Um, so we have various people that I'll be mentioning. Also, um, the main text by Savonarola that I will mention, which was his Compendium of Revelations, which was uh, delivered as a series of sermons uh, and then printed in response to uh, a command by Pope Alexander VI. Uh, and in, so it's printed in 1495. Regardless of his family's displeasure, Savonarola pursued the church with great ardor, stating that his year as a novice was the happiest of his life. Uh, he recorded that he was finally free, and by free, he means the kind of freedom when you give your life solely to one purpose, and for him, that was to God. Um, sonnets and letters authored before Savonarola joined the monastery reveal a young man struggling basically with the baser instincts of life, including sexual longings. Um, they additionally reveal an individual who felt adrift and was seeking structure and guidance, both of which Savonarola would have uh, received in the very structured monastery life of the Dominican order. So the Dominican order has a dual purpose. It is a mendicant order that goes out and actively preaches in the area in which the monastery is, which is uh, the active life, but they also have a contemplative life uh, where they would be doing meditation privately in their rooms, which are known as cells. And so this actually paralleled, you can see Savonarola's own desires for being useful, but also having that time to contemplate and to meditate. So he really flourished under the kind of restrictions uh, that he received at monastery life. And after he completed um, his courses, his basic courses at San Domenico, he became basically a master of novices at uh, Santa Maria of the Angels in Ferrara. And uh, once he um, finishes that commission, because he's basically being trained, uh, Savonarola, then around 30 years, was dispatched to the monastery of San Marco in Florence for the first time. He, he goes there twice. So Savonarola is quoted as stating that man should, quote, be guided by eloquence, or excuse me, should not be guided by elegance or human philosophy, but only by what he is able to justify according to scripture, end quote. And he really strove in his 
uh, sermons, as well as in his ideas on art, to return or to achieve the clarity and what he saw as the purity of the keys of Primitiva, the early church. And his desire for simplicity has caused a lot of scholars to say, oh, well, he just didn't understand the writings of the classical authors like Aristotle and Socrates, etc. However, um, Savonarole's own sermons and manuscripts actually disprove this theory because they do incorporate varying degrees of classical rhetoric uh, into their structures. So in 1487, Savonarola will be called back again to the monastery of San Domenico in Bologna, but this time not as a student. He's actually um, kind of in head of the studies uh, for the novices. And he is also coming back to Bologna to finish his own doctoral work, his uh, degree of sacred theology. Um, and this is the most interesting thing to me. Um, the conclusion of this degree should have promoted him on to becoming a professor of theology at a university, most likely the very uh, well-established by then University of Bologna. However, his superiors did not promote him uh, to that. And instead this left him basically uh, for a life at the pulpit, a life of being a mendicant preacher. Um, so then in 1490, um, he, he finds himself again recalled to the Florentine Monastery of San Marco by none other than Lorenzo de Medici. Now, the, the Medici family were the de facto rulers of the city-state of Florida. I'm Florida. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> city state of Florence, <laughs> excuse me, um, wishful thinking there that I'm in Florida, uh, Florence. Um, and so they basically ruled from behind. Um, and one thing we should discuss is that this Lorenzo is known as Lorenzo the Magnificent because the Medici, and this is obviously tongue in cheek, but they seem to be incapable of naming their sons anything other than a few names, such as Lorenzo, Giovanni, Piero, uh, Giuliano, and Cosimo. So we have to give them little tag names so we know who we're talking about. So this is Lorenzo the Magnificent. Um, and his invitation to Savonarola has long been seen as ironic because the friar's campaign that he begins in Florence against tyranny and ultimately uh, against the Medici family is actually credited with the downfall of Piero the Unfortunate, who was Lorenzo the Magnificent's son, and who had become uh, the head of the family and the de facto leader of the city-state of Florence upon his father's death in 1492. Um, now, I know we like to blame Savonarola for a bevy of things, but I think we also need to acknowledge the contribution of Piero the Unfortunate's lack of political acumen in the expulsion of the Medici, which happened on November 10th, 1494 uh, from Florence. Because um, it was really Piero's uh, ill fated decision to deny Charles VIII of France safe passage through the Florentine territories, which ultimately led to his uh, family's expulsion. Uh, Charles was actually on campaign to claim the uh, Kingdom of Naples, and he had counted on Florence's allegiance because Florence and France had been connected since the 13th century. And in fact, uh, even in uh, Savonarola's lifetime, many uh, profitable business connections were between the city of Florence in France, particularly uh, in fabric trade. Um, so Piero's decision to side with Naples rather than the French monarchy was very surprising uh, and impolitic. It really didn't bode well for him. So um, as the French troops were literally marching towards the city of Florence, Savonarola was preaching um, about the downfall of Italy and that God would soon scourge the peninsula. Um, and so it seemed to the Italians that this was actually about to happen. And in fact, the common man of Florence 
uh, readily accepted Savonarola's predictions of impending doom, and it's likely that the fortuitously timed invasion of Charles uh, the Eighth also encouraged this rapid ex acceptance. Um, fulfilling the uh, excuse me, following the apparent fulfillment of Savonarola's prophecy, his influence affected not only religious and political arenas in Florence, but also the artistic areas as well, and how art was used. And um, we will discuss how several paintings executed by Sandro Botticelli, as well as Fra, Fra Bartolomeo, um, were actually destroyed in the bonfires of the vanities. The artists themselves destroyed the works. Um, not so much Fra Bartolomeo, but certainly Botticelli and other artists of his time period uh, threw their own paintings on. Uh, and this is really, um, we also have paintings by both of these artists that we're going to look at in depth in a couple minutes. And they definitely reference uh, the predictions of Savonarola. Um, and it also recalls earlier, whoops, I always forget how to move in Zoom earlier. Oh, I forgot to show you this beautiful slide. I'm sorry. So I wanted to show you a little bit of uh, San Marco, which is no longer an operating monastery because the Dominican numbers of monks in Florence have declined to such a point that only Santa Maria Novella still has a functioning monastery. Um, but this is some of the beautiful paintings by the earlier artist and Dominican monk, Fra Angelico, and his workshop, and then one of the beautiful rooms of the Monastery of San Marco in Florence, which is today a museum, and hopefully many of you have been there. Um, but basically, um, this uh, his uh, kind of messages on how art should be used, et cetera, um, really, and his censure of certain artworks really recalls the Florentines' attempt to seek God's protection through art. And of course, by this, I'm referencing the much earlier in the early 1400s, very famous um, competition of the baptistry doors. Uh, but, and of course, there were seven uh, panels, uh, seven artists competed for this, and Brunelleschi and Ghiberti were the last two, and of course it was awarded to Ghiberti. Um, and so this was an example where the Florentines were surrounded by the Milanese, and they had made a promise to God or a show of faith that if God um, saved their city from ruin, uh, that they would actually uh, cast this beautiful set of doors um, to honor him on the baptistry, the uh, baptistry of San Giovanni. And of course, uh, Duke Visconti did die, so their promise was, um, was granted. So um, we need to talk a little bit about uh, itinerant preachers that were also in the areas uh, that Savonarola had kind of frequented, um, because in particular, one of them actually, I think, really influenced Savonarola's own actions. Um, so contemporaneous with Savonarola, uh, the Franciscan Bernardino da Feltre, uh, who dies in 1494, um, also put forth eschatological prophecies. Uh, but actually, we don't know so much about him, or he's not as well known, because his anti-Semitic statements actually overshadowed these predictions. So although Savonarola is more prominent than Bernard Bernardino, we can really look to the Franciscans' activities um, and say that they certainly influenced Savonarola. Uh, for instance, in 1488, Bernardino attempted to expel the Jews uh, from all of Italy, but in particular Florence, and to do so, he enlisted what's known as the Giovane, or the young boys of the city, to pray for their removal. Later, uh, and this is really important, in 1493, Bernardino's summer of sermonizing uh, culminated in a bonfire comprised of items known as vanities, such as women's makeup, jewelry, fine clothes, tapestries, and works of art. And Savonarola's employment uh, later uh, in the city of the male youth uh, in his processions and his Lenten, Lenten bonfires echo the earlier attempts of Bernardino. So this brief account really reveals, um, this brief account, I should say, of Savonarola's peer really reveals that Savonarola wasn't breaking with um, prophecy uh, kind of tradition. He was actually building upon it and staying within the Tuscan spiritual precedents. 
Uh, and in fact, the increasing interest in prophecy during the 15th and 16th centuries developed in tandem with an interest in classical literature. Um, and that might seem a little weird to us, but the humanists were using these treatises from antiquity to kind of explain the strife of their own life and political events and whatnot. And with the advent of the printing press, um, we really see that prophecies could be gathered from different time periods that had been written down and then all bound together and printed. So throughout the Italian peninsula, you had publications and itinerant preachers who were really the main method of dispersal for messages of reform about the church. Um, and therefore, um, and I've I've talked about this at length uh, over in Germany, it's really not a stretch to say that the printing press was instrumental in both the first, the Italian, and then later the Protestant uh, reform um, attempts, um, because it was it allowed the message to be further dissipated and much more quickly uh, sent around. So the interesting thing about these pamphlets, these prophecy pamphlets, is that they could contain stories um, and be altered to suit any location. So you could swap out the title of Florence, the town of Florence, for Siena or for Lucca, and then those prophecies would resonate uh, in that local area. And Savonarola actually is, um, people don't give him enough credit. He was really brilliant in utilizing printing techniques to disperse his message and his sermons. And a lot of people also don't know this, he quickly became the most published Italian author in the Quattrocento, so in the 1400s. And Florence itself boasted the highest number of these prophetic pamphlets during the friar's time at San Marco. Um, and all levels of society, including lay and ecclesiastic officials, uh, purchased them. So there, there still are many in existence today in library collections. So many of the prophecies contained within these leaflets had themes that aligned the spiritual renewal of the church with a French king. However, the prediction of a second Charlemagne was the most popular political divination during this time. This prophecy, which maintained that the new Charlemagne would free Florence and her territories from oligarchical rule, rule was well suited to Savonarola's attack on corruption and on the Medici um, rule itself. And this version promised that a French king would do three things. It would first reclaim Jerusalem for Christianity, second, unite the world in Christianity, and third, initiate the spiritual renewal of Italy. Italy. Um, so let's look at how these prophecies um, kind of helped Savonarola gain power uh, within Florence. So he's elected prior, which is the head of the Monastery of San Marco in 1491. So that's only a year after he gets there. And we can really state that Savonarola's rise in power from just solely prior of the monastery um, to a, a role in the Florentine government, the new Florentine Republic that will be established, um, really aligns closely with the French king's invasion of Florence on September 21st, 1494. So it's really after 1494 that Savonarola moves into uh, polit uh, politics as far as governing the city. And while Charles the Eighth actually was marching towards the city. The Florentines knew that he was coming and they were dreading this. And Savonarola delivered what uh, is considered to be his famous terrible sermon. And in this homily, he professed that the French were God's elected instrument of punishment and that the time had come for Florence uh, to be castigated for her sins. Another aspect um, of history that's often downplayed is the fact that Savonarola was quickly trusted as a member of uh, this new Florentine Republic that developed once the Medici family was expelled from the city state. Um, and so on November 5th of 1494, Savonarola left the safety of Florence with the Florentine delegation to go meet with Charles VIII. And he had been elected to head this um, delegation to renegotiate the terms that Piero the Unfortunate 
Fishnet had originally uh, tried to establish in a botched pack with the French king. And this delegation hoped not only to secure the safety of their city, but also to regain the lost territories that a very nervous Piero the Unfortunate had kind of just been like, well, here, uh, take, um, take Luca, take this territory, take that territory to try to save his own city of Florence. So it's really a measure of the growing reputation and the trust placed in him that he was not only sent on this delegation, but elected to head it. Because what that really shows us as historians is that he was known for being able to do delicate negotiations. And in fact, he, he really did. He was able to do a good job at negotiating with the French king. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry, there's that virus kicking up. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> After these events, Savonarola began to read the Bible differently. He begins to kind of read it more purposely, locating the parallels between the canonical text and contemporary events. So prior, <clears throat> excuse me, to 1494, he relied more on the book of Genesis and the theme of the deluge to kind of uh, scare his listeners um, or provide an analogy for the threat that was facing Italy and uh, Florence in particular posed by the French siege. After this, uh, this, this siege is avoided, Savonarola turns to um, Haggai, who was the prophet who had ur urged the Jews to rebuild the temple. Solomon in Jerusalem, and he associates this biblical story of rebuilding to the construction of a new Florence, and he kept preaching about Florence is the new Jerusalem. All right, so let's talk about his downfall. Um, so during the initial formation of the Second Florentine Republic, which runs between 1494 when Piero and his family are expelled, um, uh, to 1512. Uh, uh, and so the first of the years that it's being developed uh, when Savonarola's power is at its zenith are really from 1494 to 1495. Um, so He's at his height of his power at that time, but his political and religious clout are quickly going to dissipate. And it some there's some reasons for this, but um, he may have been unaware uh, that his call to unite the church and the state actually threatened the wealthy oligarchical families that remained in Florence and had hoped once the Medici were gone that they could kind of fill that role. Um, or he might have truly believed, as he professed in his sermons, that God desired this union of church and state, a theocracy, basically, and there, thereby uh, would assist and protect his messenger, meaning himself. Convictions aside, the friars end, and this is a... Um, Oh, it's not my bad pun yet. I have a really bad pun coming up. <laughs> but convictions aside, the friar's end was really signaled by King Charles VIII's uh, departure from uh, France uh, and return to uh, France in the summer of 1495, because this action really left Savonarola vulnerable. He no, no longer kind of had that hook of like, well, I am the one who's the intermediator between God and France and Florence. Um, and so um, this, uh, as he had continued to urge the, the Florentines to ally themselves with the French rather than with the papacy, um, and this was headed by Pope Alexander VI, who was the Borgia Pope um, and his Holy League. So this causes problems for Florence with the Vatican. And on May 13th, 1497, Pope Alexander VI will finally excommunicate uh, Savonarola. Um, and uh, it forces the Florentines to choose between their uh, friar, their prophet, or their pope. And what the pope did to convince the Florentines to choose him is he threatened the entire city with interdict which basically would remove the um, sacrament of baptism from all Florentine citizens. And in their eyes, that would have been damnation uh, for eternal hell. So the Pope's threat combined with a famine and a wave of plague that came around at this time heightened the animosity of Savonarola's critics who blamed the friar for the city's problems. And even beyond this, some of his own followers became disenchanted with him because of the ineffectiveness 
of the new Republican government, and they started to denounce their former leader. Given the volatile situation in Florence, it was not long, this is my bad pun, <laughs> before a spark ignited a fire, which would seal Savonarola's fate. Uh, Luca Landucci's diary, he was a contempor contemporary uh, diarist, provides a sense of his followers' disillusionment um, following the Frate's trial and execution. Uh, he writes, quote, he whom we had held to be a prophet confessed that he was no prophet. My heart was grieved to see such an edifice fall uh, on the, to the ground on account of having been founded on a lie, end quote. Even years after Savonarola's death, and even to today, really, um, Florentines and Italians in general continue to debate, doubt, and even revere the Dominican friar from Ferrara. Today, the same argument endures in scholarship and in the Roman Catholic Church. The dispute concerning Savonarola's nature, whether saintly or heretical, is continued by the Dominican order, which actively seeks its beatification for uh, Savonarola, and the Vatican, which actively keeps denying it. All right, so let's look a little bit at um, Savonarola and whoops, uh, his kind of statements he made about art. So despite the fact that Savonarola um, directed two um, bonfires of the vanities that were uh, around the time of Lent, so the first one was February 7th, 1497, the second was February 27th, 1498, uh, Savonarola was not, as has sometimes been said, an iconoclast. He actually understood the power of art. Uh, he understood how it could be used to help the faithful understand the narratives of the Bible, especially those that were illiterate. But he also knew that art could be distracting unless it was created without artifice. So without this uh, very luxurious materials and very realistic looking imagery. Uh, so Savonarola's desire to see paintings and sculptures embrace what he termed simplicita, which means simplicity, actually recalls Aristotle's conception that all nature is created by a power higher than man, and thus art should reflect what is visible in nature. So he was aware of his classical authors. Um, artists were not spared censure from Savonarola. He spoke out against the use of common people for models, stating that one should not re represent the defined figures as such. Uh, he likewise opposed the inclusion of recognizable portraits within religious works of art. Uh, and he claimed uh, they distracted the viewer. He would surely have opposed the decorative schemes like these visible in the Tornaboni Chapel in the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella, which I show you here. Um, because here we not only have Domenico Ghirlandaio using very uh, luxurious types of garments, uh, you know, for the holy figures and setting um, the Virgin Mary's family in this really luxurious palatial interior you can see that on the figure uh, the image on the left which is the birth of the virgin but in both images he actually includes members um, of the Torna Buoni family that are within the same holy space as the divine figures uh, and this is going to actually this type of doing this in art is actually going to result to when we get Cosimo Primo, uh, the first Grand Duke of Tuscany, who is a member of the Medici family, when he comes to power, he's actually going to commission from an artist known as Agnolio Bronzino, an altarpiece that depicts his mother as the Virgin Mary. So talk about sacrilegious. I think that would have had um, Savonarola rolling in his grave. Uh, in his sermon on the books of Ruth and Micah, delivered on November 2nd, 1496, Savonarola spoke of the importance of living one's life in preparation for death. And this same homily, he provided the lady with specific instructions of what types of art objects to commission and how to use them. And I have to say that I don't think I would want these hanging up in my house. <laughs> um, we're seeing some images here from a 1502 uh, publication of The Art of Dying Well, which was one of Savonarola's bestsellers. Um, it accompanied um, basically his instructions for living a good life so that therefore your death was, was uh, good and you ended up going to heaven. So he instructed people to commission three pictures for their house. Um, 
the first one was supposed to be a picture of heaven and hell, and that should be placed in your bedroom. And you should look at it often, but not too often to get jaded to its contents. Um, you were supposed to, when you looked at it, remember that your actions on, uh, in this life would influence your actions into the next life, uh, and that you could go to somewhere very nice, uh, or you could actually go to somewhere much more humid and hot than, Sam, uh, than, um, Sarasota, if you weren't careful. <laughs> um, the next image that he recommended was the one you see on the left here, uh, which is an image of a sick man with deaf, death um, knocking on the door. And this message uh, that he was imparting to the congregation was to not be complaining, to accept whatever trials that Christ uh, and that God send to you, because the devil, and we have some cute little devils, I don't know if you can see my pointer over here. Um, are just waiting to grab your soul. So they're still waiting for you to screw up even as you're, um, you know, very sick. Um, and then the third image on the right uh, is the dying man's uh, confession or the deathbed confession. And here we have um, a uh, monk or a, a priest, parish priest, who has come to hear the dying man's confession. His family is grieving around him. We have death waiting to take him. Um, we have the virgin and child up in heaven. And we have these pesky devils, again, just waiting if he should say a cross word to the priest, or if he should yell at his wife for not bringing him water quick enough or something, just waiting to snatch his soul. Um, for those who found that they were too tempted by material goods, such as pictures, he actually suggested that they remember to wear their spectacles of death, uh, which as an eyeglass wearer really creeps me out. Um, and he actually advised them to carry in their hand and to look at it often a small symbol of death. So perhaps a skull, a carved skull or a crossbone um, carved out of bone. He wanted you to carry that with so that you could constantly remind yourself of this. Oops. Um, so we also have some artists um, that I mentioned earlier whose work is known to illustrate um, various sermons, prophecies um, that were uh, spread by Savonarola. So both Sandro Botticelli and Fra Bartolomeo are the two artists that are most commonly ex uh, associated with Savonarola. And um, we have to be a little careful here because past scholarship has associated both of them, has claimed that both of them were adherents to Savonarola, that they were both his followers. And really the only proof for that with Botticelli, and you're looking at two of his late paintings here, is that Botticelli's brother, Simone, was a follower of Savonarola and, in, and a very um, ardent one at that. He had to actually um, leave Florence uh, when uh, Savonarola was uh, excommunicated and finally um, tried and uh, executed. And the only um, mention that we have that Botticelli shared these same kind of um, thoughts and, uh, and uh, you know, followed the Savonarola's ideas is that his brother wrote this. Uh, and so we can't really necessarily trust that because uh, Botticelli continued to work for families of the, uh, the wealthy oligarchy families who both supported the Medici, those that were against him, as well as for for um, very obviously, in the case of these two paintings, um, Savonarola adherence. So those that were commissioning him sometimes would request to have imagery that gave them remembrances of the executed friar. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're looking at the artist Mystic uh, Crucifixion from circa 1500 on the right, and his very strange Mystic Nativity on the left. And these both reflect Savonarola's philosophies, but they do so in fundamentally different ways. So the Mystic Crucifixion, actually, uh, through my research of about, oh God, Oh, since I've been studying him, uh, well, for at least 10 years, maybe longer. Um, so my research of his sermons and prophecies shows that the mystic uh, cruc crucifixion conflates several of the friars' well-known prophecies and sermons into kind of a generalized reminder of the martyr Dominican. Uh, its imagery concomitantly alluded to his promise that Florence would become the new Jerusalem. Um, and um, 
It also uh, conversely, uh, I should say, in his mystic nativity, if we just pop back here, recalls uh, something different. Uh, his mystic nativity conversely recalls one section of his um, of Savonarola's publication, The Compendium of Revelations. Now, it's interesting to discuss the Compendium of Revelations because it was um, written by Savonarola and then self-published along with the only work of art that Savonarola himself commissioned to go along with this publication. And the reason he wrote this was that in for, uh, July 21st of 1485, he received a summons from Pope Alexander VI in Rome, telling him that he needed to travel to Rome uh, and to defend his prophecies. And the reason that the Pope did this is he was saying things like uh, that the uh, Pope Alexander was the son of the whore of Babylon, and that's not really going to um, make the Pope like you. Um, and so uh, he was called to actually uh, you know, Rome to do this. And he knew that he would have been killed. He knew he would have never either reached Rome or reached Florence on his return. Um, so instead, he wrote this very long, and I have to admit, quite boring, actually, uh, manuscript called the Compendium of Revelations, where he goes into detail about all of these prophecies that he delivered in his sermons, and he defends them point by point. Um, and we can really use not only the compendium itself, the text of it, but we can also uh, use the engraving, which I'm going to show you in a minute, which was commissioned by Savonarola to really decipher this painting that you're looking at here. So in the compendium of Revelations, Savonarola talks for at least 27 pages. And I know because I wrote 57 pages on, about those 27 pages about this crown that he had been given um, for a mystical voyage uh, to go to heaven and to give it to the Virgin Mary on behalf of the Florentine people. So let's go ahead and look at the engraving kind of side by side. Um, so the, we can use the, the uh, a comparison of these two images as well as his actual text. Um, and we're going to see some really interesting similarities. Um, first of all, the compositions, um, and this is where we're doing our visual analysis, which I do with my students every day in class, the com uh, compositions of both the engraving and the painting are basically in three registers, uh, three horizontal tiers. Uh, and this implies that Botticelli had a copy of the Compendium of Revelations that included this engraving. And that is very, very likely because it was the first edition which Savonarola paid for um, was widely published and it was uh, widely circulated throughout Florence as well. Uh, we can actually connect his uh, text of the Compendium uh, to uh, the painting in a much stronger way if we look at these bander rolls of the angels, and they have abbreviations which in person are legible because I flew to London to be able to finish up my research on this painting. Um, and if you're in person and know Latin, you can decipher them. Um, so the, the bander rolls are hel held by these 12 floating angels, and the inscriptions on them refer to the Virgin Mary's or the Madonna's 12 privileges. Um, and these 12 privileges are listed in the Compendium of Revelations, um, and some of them are actually altered or slightly fabricated by Savonarola. So there's no other way that Botticelli could have been aware of these particular privileges unless he was either having the patron talk to him about this text and those privileges, or he had a copy of it himself. So it, it definitely is related. Um, uh, in my dissertation, I go into detail about the colors used by Botticelli also reflect the colors described by Savonarola in this illustration here um, of the crown being presented to the Virgin Mary, because every level was a certain jewel that had jewels inset on it and flowers woven in and out, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he described in detail what those colors referenced uh, as far as the privileges of the Madonna. Um, Botticelli's three-level composition with its inclusion of these privileges clearly was formed by the words then and the 
friars treat us as well, and the imagery as well, I should say. And so approaching Botticelli's mystical device with this information really leads me to what was my theory and what I presented about this particular painting is that this was commissioned by an adherent, a follower of the recently executed uh, friar, and that it was commissioned as a mnemonic device um, so that it would remind um, the uh, follower of Savonarola of the order of prayers that were um, that Savonarola had written about that you needed to say to the Virgin Mary, and they were supposed to be said in a certain order. And it is my belief uh, that the um, painting actually shows these mnemonically, um, rather than just writing out, say this, say that, say this, uh, and that followers of Savonarola would have been familiar, especially if they owned the, the treatise, the manuscript of the Compendium of Revelations. Now, this is likely accurate that it was commissioned by followers of Savonarola because the first mention of this painting is in the Villa Aldo Brandini, which is um, a family we'll discuss in a minute, in Rome. And that's the first citation we have of this being uh, noted, and it's noted in the family inventory of their possessions. And the Florentine branch of the Aldo Brandini family was avidly devoted Devoted to Savonarola. And uh, it's therefore my belief that they commissioned this painting. And later, when a member of their family actually was raised to a cardinalship, that he probably took this painting along with him uh, to uh, the Roman villa. Uh, in fact, the family was so uh, aligned with Savonarola that four members of the Aldobrandi. Aldo Brandini family actually signed a petition sent to Pope Alexander VI on behalf of Savonarola to try to get his excommunication lifted. And although the pairs in the front here, which are really the most confusing or arcane part of the image, because it's an angel with an with a human, and they appear to be well, we're not really sure if they're hugging, if they're wrestling. Um, so this is, you know, kind of difficult to explain, um, and many people have explained them away, saying they are the embracing pairs that are referenced in Psalm 8510. Um, however, um, I think that with the Madonna's privileges visible on the bander rolls, it more strongly advocates that the compendium's text um, really does relate to this painting rather than the, the Psalm 8510, which other scholars have said explains this painting. Um, Okay, let me move on to another one so we can let you have your questions soon. Um, not unlike the mystic nativity, Botticelli's mystic crucifixion explores a Savonarolian themes, uh, divine punishment, repentance, mercy, and renewal. However, I don't believe that this was commissioned as the other one was as a mnemonic device or a memory aid. I think this is more commissioned in remembrance of kind of a, confla a conflation of various prophecies that um, Savonarola had said. Um, and if we break it down, we can see that it's a very unfamiliar type of crucifixion scene. And unfortunately, this is in the Fogg Museum uh, in Harvard. And unfortunately, this is in really ruinous condition. It has nothing to do with it being in Harvard for that reason, but time has not been gentle with it. And a lot of the painted surface is abraded. So it's going to be difficult to see some of these details I'm going to be discussing. But we have a composition that's basically dissected vertically by the crucifix. And the crucifix actually supports, or the cross, I should say, supports the deceased Christ here. And we have Mary Magdalene, um, and she is here uh, lamenting the death of her leader and beloved friend. Um, and she's clinging to the base of the cross. And we have an angel that stands to her right that holds aloft a small animal by its tail. And then it has a, a, a stick, a bastone, uh, in its hand right here. Uh, which it appears ready to um, to strike the animal with. 
Um, another animal, which is almost impossible to see, um, so some people say it's here and some people say it's here, it's been a long time since I've seen this image in person, um, is identified as a wolf, and that is emerging from the bottom of Mary Magdalene's uh, mantle. And then we know that this scene of the crucifixion is set outside of uh, the Florentine walls because we have uh, Brunelleschi's very famous uh, dome here to uh, Santa Maria del Fiore, the city's uh, cathedral in the back, as well as other recognizable um, buildings here as well that indicate it's Florence. So Florence as the new Jerusalem, of course. All right. So just a few more things about this. We've got God the Father up in heaven who appears to be holding a text, which he's shown very often doing so, but he also appears to have his hand up in blessing. Um, and you can see on this side of the composition, we have a clear blue sky. We have shields that are a white shield with a red cross on them that are kind of raining down on this side of the city. But over here, we have thunder and flames and we have these um hands that hold sticks to like sticks of punishment to like beat people and so the cathedral's dome in the back is not the only allusion to Florence. The small um, animal here that is being restrained by the angel has been identified by many scholars as a reference to the Florentine Merzacco, that a Florentine heraldic lion that even to today is seen as a, a symbol of Florence. And Savonarola had um, given sermons where he repeatedly issued warnings to Florence and to the Medician government in the guise of their, the Merzacco of this Florentine lion. And so we can read that Botticelli's angel who's whipping this animal could embody or could symbolize God's anger towards the sinful Florentines, whereas the uh, figure of Mary Magdalene, who is, um, you know, could who is one who is known to have been a sinner and then forgiven by Christ, could actually symbolize the repentant Florentines or the repentant church itself. Um, so, in this context, then. Um, we have another allusion to something that Savonarola used to say, because we have that small wolf-like animal um, that is emerging from the Magdalene's cloak um, that can be understood then as a metaphor for the corrupt clergy who Savonarola routinely attacked in his sermons, and he called them wolves. He said those of, of lukewarm faith are wolves, and he believed that they were the cause of Florence's downfall. Um, we're going to just move on to, uh, I'm just checking my time, make sure I'm doing okay. Oh, I'm, I'm ahead. I must be nervous. I speak fast when I'm nervous. <laughs> Um, so we're going to move on to some paintings by Fra Bartolomeo, which again, I do not think function as mnemonic devices, um, because A, they're large, they were altarpieces, um, but also they just kind of present more generalized information and references to sermons or sayings uh, that were said by Savonarola. So we're going to look at two by him. Uh, we will look at Madonna della Misericordia coming up, but right now we're looking at God the Father with St. Catherine. Uh, of Siena and Mary Magdalene. Um, and so Bartolomeo's uh, allusions to the martyred Dominican's ideology are much more transparent. He, he's including Dominican saints. He's putting adages that um, were directly referred to, uh, related, I should say, to Savonarola in his paintings that are legible to us. And one reason that he's doing this is that uh, it is believed, or Giorgio Vasari um, has written, that um, Fra Bartolomeo joined the, the Dominican order after the execution of Savonarola because he was so inspired by the um, deceased friar's doctrine. And um, we always have to watch what we take away as truth from, um, from Vasari because he likes to tall, tell tall tales. However, um, this does seem to be accurate uh, because he joined the Dominican order and he creates works of art that then include references to Savonarola in them. Another reason that his works might have more blatant or more readable 
uh, references to the uh, Savonarola is likely because he was a Dominican monk, right? Fra Bartolomeo became a Dominican monk. He was uh, the main artist for um, the Dominicans at San Marco. <clears throat> excuse me, following, um, of course, a much earlier Fra Angelico, who did those beautiful frescoes um, at uh, San Marco. And so his, the works he's creating were being produced for individuals that were in religious Dominican houses, so other monasteries and convents, or for people that um, agreed with the beliefs of the Dominican faith. So it would make sense that he would be able to be a little bit more visible in his references. Um, so let's see, let's go right to this one. I have some text to go along with it. Now, of course, we are not seeing these in person, which is very unfortunate. Um, some of the text we can see, such as up here, we have basically the alpha and the omega symbols, um, which of course refer to I am the beginning and the end. Um, and that, of course, references the Book of Revelation, which was a book that Savonarola was rather fond of, since it's kind of full of fire and damnation. Um, and then we have other um, written texts on here that aren't very visible to us. For example, I have a blue arrow pointing to um, the text that says, our con conversation is in heaven, although we live on earth. And it, these are abbreviations that refer to that, that, uh, that epistle from the uh, oh gosh Philip Philip how do you even pronounce that Philippians well that just shows uh, how I don't know how to pronounce my my early Christian names um, this is next to Mary Magdalene and we know it's Mary Magdalene because she's shown holding a, a little jar her ointment jar for when she anointed the feet of Christ now if we go down one more bullet point uh, we have a saying down here that is uh, closer to St. Catherine of Siena uh, that is translated, I in love suffer, which is taken from the Song of Songs. Um, and then, of course, God up in heaven is holding the symbols of the Alpha Omega. Uh, and this is I am the beginning and the end. Um, and then underneath that, the little putti here, uh, or cherubim, um, depending. Cherubims, technically, they're one of the orders of angels, and technically, artists show them just as baby heads with wings. So uh, usually, I've referred to these wings that have bodies as being uh, pooty, but technically, pooty are more pagan. But anyway, I digress. Um, but you can see that that little angel holds a phrase, and my cat has jumped up behind me right now, so she's joining us. Um, the love of God creates ecstasy. Uh, these were all things that Savonarola wrote about, these particular phrases. They were all things that he said in his sermons, and in particular, almost every sermon he gave, he um, incorporated the adage of the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, let's move on to our next and last painting before we open for questions. Uh, this is the Madonna della Misericordia or the Madonna of Mercy. And for anybody who was not raised Roman Catholic, the Madonna is the Italian term that is used for the Virgin Mary um, in, uh, in Italy. So Bartolomeo's Madonna della Misericordia is a really eccentric reinterpretation of the Renaissance Mother Misericordia or Mater Misericordia, Mother of Mercy theme. And it is the strangest, well, one of the strangest I've ever seen. Um, one of the reasons it's so unusual is um, that we have the inclusion of Christ, who's hovering above his mother. Some have described it almost uh, like a bat. Um, and uh, Christ is not usually incorporated in these visions. And we also have the Virgin Mary's mantle, who's, which is being animated by two uh, angels um, that are spreading it out to cover the people um, underneath her, because in this role of the Madonna of Mercy, uh, this was usually used as a plague image, and the Madonna's 
uh, mantle was usually uh, covering the people that were much smaller normally be underneath her. And so it would be coming down normally around the Madonna with the people kind of hiding inside of it. And then angels would be shooting arrows of plague from heaven and they would bounce off or break once they hit the Madonna's robe, her mantle. So this is a very different interpretation of it. Um, and it again concerns um, a lot of the things that Savonarola himself was interested in and which he spoke about. We also, um, as an art historian, I need to point out that Bartolomeo does a really nice job of using this kind of mystical gray cloud that comes up behind the Virgin's mantle and then obscures or truncates the lower half of um, the risen Christ because, you know, otherwise, and this is the crucified and risen Christ, because otherwise we, it would be a little dicey. Uh, the Christ, uh, his legs would look like he was about to land on his mother's head. So having that um, really helps, um, you know, kind of make the painting a little bit more pleasant to look at. Um, but I've marked out here that the plaque um, actually is from the Gospel of St. Mark, which is um, the Savior's profession of forgiveness. Uh, and um, to read it out, it says, I have compassion on the multitude for behold, they have been, they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat, end quote. Um, and of course, one of Savonarola's main themes after the city of Florence was spared, and um, even a little bit before, but mainly after, was God's clemency and that God had forgiven the Florentines and that it was because of their burning of their important, you know, jewelry and clothing and works of art and their show of devoutness that Florence had been spared. Um, so basically, to kind of end my little um, talk, I want to talk about um, what happened in some of these bonfires of the vanities. So we do have some primary sources which recount various artists that were so shaken up by uh, the sermons given by Savonarola um, that they actually willingly through their own mythological or rather lascivious paintings, maybe of nudes onto these two bonfires of the vanities. Um, we know in particular that um, Botticelli did. Uh, most likely it was probably some of his mythological paintings. Uh, and he he's really associated, Botticelli is really associated with the Medici family because he created those beautiful um, you know, the birth of Venus, the primavera, uh, mainly for the Medici family, he created these just gorgeous mythological works of art. Um, so we did lose a lot of works of art, uh, thanks to Savonarola. We have discussions of these works of art or descriptions, I should say, but we did end up losing some of them. However, I'd like to really end, oh, and of course, I forgot to mention many books um, that were perhaps uh, a little naughty in what they talked about, or many of, uh, you know, the stories of like Ovid's metamorphosis were thrown also on the pyre, um, you know, these bonfires of the vanities. But I'd really like to end with the fact that these later artists, uh, you know, working after the execution of Savonarola, their work was greatly influenced by um, Savonarola's sermons and his own manuscripts because these continued to circulate heavily, even though they were, people were not supposed to have them and the Vatican made an attempt to round up uh, Savonarola's manuscripts. Um, almost, it's it's actually estimated that every single religious institution on the peninsula of Italy had um, one, if not more, manuscripts uh, that had been written and then printed, of course, with the printing press by Savonarola in their library collection. Um, so the availability of these biographies and sermons really does attest to the persistence of um, Savonarola's doctrine and his adherence uh, in Florence, despite persecution um, promoted by the Vatican, by the papacy, to kind of wipe out anybody who had followed um, Savonarola. 
Lastly, though, Savonarola himself is going to be censured because finally in 1559, um, Pope Paul IV uh, issues a papal edict, and in that he finally bans uh, a majority of Savonarola's treatises. And at that point, a more systematic collection of them is made, and uh, publishers were, were not supposed to continue to publish them. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop my loquaciousness and um, and kind of turn it over to all of you in case you have questions. And folks, feel free to type in the chat as well um, and to give people just a moment to uh, think through some things. Uh, Christine, I do have a question for you, if that's Great. okay. Yes. Um, so uh, the first question I have for you is almost um, a personal one, kind of what turned you on to Savonarola in the first oh. place? I know you mentioned that you love to talk about him and yeah. no one ever wants to talk about him with you. Um, <laughs> and you've been studying him for all these years. Kind of how did that happen for you? Um, well, it's very funny. Um and I should have included a picture of this in the presentation, but I didn't want to wax on too long. Um, my dissertation really focuses on a much later artist um, known as Jacopo Pantormo. And I was certain that a painting by Jacopo Pantormo called The Visitation, but he did two visitations, Pantormo did. And this is his second one that I'm referencing, which is in um, uh, Carmignano in Italy. And I was certain that that painting had to reference, because it's an odd painting, um, that it had to reference some kind of theology or some kind of scripture or something. Um, I was just certain of it because the the imagery, uh, it shows the Virgin Mary and uh, her uh, St. Elizabeth, her older cousin, meeting um, is when um, the Virgin Mary is recognized as the mother of God. You know, it's the, the incarnation, basically. And um, and behind them are two women, very close, that look identical, and they're staring out at the viewer. And so I was just like, gosh, this has to mean something. And um, I, as a normal person would, picked up a volume on Savonarola's uh, prophecies and sermons. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure all of you do that on occasion. <laughs> Guess I'm not that normal. Um, and started reading. And he wrote about the two parts of the Virgin Mary, the interior part and the exterior part, the worldly part and the spiritual part, being that she was both this young girl who was asked to be the mother of God, but then she was also, um, you know, like, so she was human, but she was also kind of divine in that she gets elevated to divinity in a way by being Christ's mother. And I just kept staring at that painting and reading that por portion um, discussed by Savonarola over and over again. And I just thought, these cannot just be the handmaidens that the biblical narrative says accompanied the Virgin Mary and St. Elizabeth at their meeting, because why are they doppelgangers? They look identical. Um, I was like, there has to be a reason for the artist repeating these two. And then I started looking into, well, was Savonarola's sermon and manuscript even available to Pontormo or the people who could have commissioned him? And that's when I found out that they were still being widely circulated. And so it was a distinct possibility. So I actually argue um, that that's what influenced at least the people who commissioned the the visitation by Pontormo, if not the artist himself. And so that really brought me to my love of Savonarola. And so then um, my doctoral advisor suggested that I open the scope of my study to incorporate these other artists who had been acknowledged to be connected to Savonarola, um, which I did so. And then I received a uh, fellowship. So basically I received funding to go study at the Bridwell well, library, which is a theological library at, on the campus of Southern uh, Methodist University in Dallas, and they, outside of Europe, have the largest collection of printed manuscripts um, from Savonarola, so these early printed manuscripts, and I was able to use them uh, personally, and so I just, um, yeah, I, I did way more research than was probably necessary on Savonarola, but I 
still to this day find him a very complex and confusing individual. And I still um, question, was he really receiving these prophecies or was he twisting them slight, slightly for his advantage? Um, so thank you for that question. You said you had a second? I do, but there is one in the chat as well. And then I know Elisa has one. So I'll defer oh. uh, maybe to the chat and then to Elisa. Sure. I love to talk about how Savonarola was executed. <laughs> um, so he, along with two of his followers, and it's a big, long brouhaha of how this happened. And that's why I made that unfortunate pun about a spark becoming a fire. Uh, they were hanged uh, in the Piazza della Signoria, so right in front of what's known as the Palazzo vecchio in florence um uh, so he along with two of his followers his most adherent uh or i should say ardent followers they were all strung up on a scaffolding and then they were simultaneously burned because they lit the scaffolding on fire and then wait for it and i'm not done yet um then they actually when the embers finally burned down they chopped everything up and word is at least our kind primary sources of this say that all the remains were then swept into the Arno because they were so fearful that the followers of Savonarola would uh, take bones or whatever they could get and would make a martyr out of him. But if any of you have been to the monastery of San Marco, you know that they've already done this. They have uh, his prayer beads. They have a swatch of his habit because he would have had more than one. Um, they have a plain cross um, that is uh, all displayed in the cell that was his as the prior of San Marco. And then they have a piece of the wood, supposedly, from the fire that was used to execute him. Um, so that is actually how he was executed. We, you know, to us, it's very gruesome, of course, but to them, uh, unfortunately, these types of events uh, were actually entertainment, you know, beheadings, public hangings, public shamings, all that kind of stuff, um, you know, uh, because there was no Netflix, apparently, so. Um, Elisa? Yeah, Christine, I have a question, and I don't recall that you covered this, but I'm curious, was there any real robust objection to Savonarola's uh, censorship of books at the time? I mean, were there libraries that were uh, uh, involved in this? Um, yeah, how much, how much uh, 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 you know, bite back was there about the censorship issue? Right. And this is a timely issue because we are seeing our own libraries right now facing some censure in certain cases. Um, not that I've been able to locate in the Florentine archives when I've been there researching. Um, of course, the Laurentian Library uh, created under Lorenzo the Magnificent was already in existence by this time. And of course, the Medici had been expelled from the city, so that probably did make it to a certain extent vulnerable. However, I have not found any records of anybody going into a collection of books or a library at that time and uh, taking the books and throwing them onto these fires. Uh, what I have found in diaries, et cetera, is people throwing their own books that might have been like the collection of Ovid's Metamorphosis. So like that's the loves of the gods, you know, that can, and it can get a little racy or some of these, you know, there was pornography um, going, well, we have it on, um, we have examples of pornography uh, that I don't show my students, but I have them from ancient Egypt. So um, there was certainly pornography at this time that would have been printed in little pamphlet forms. Um, so we believe that it's more those kinds of things that were thrown onto the fires. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Katie, any questions? Last ones for you? Mine was very similar to Elisa as well um, about any kind of contemporary pushback to the censorship, either from uh, Savonarola's censorship or then the subsequent uh, censorship of Savonarola. 
Well, the very interesting thing is that <clears throat> there was a large, I mean, I would say the majority of the population was so terrified of this invasion that they initially followed Savonarola. And um, the reason I pointed out the shields on the mystic crucifixion by Botticelli that had the white shield with the red cross is that when he utilized the Giovane, those young groups of boys to go around in the city and kind of promote his message, they were dressed in white robes with red crosses and embroidered on them. And part of their uh, thing that these boys did, and in a way, when I teach this to my students, I equate it, unfortunately, to the Hitler youth, is that they actually were um, going door to door and shaming uh, the people in the households and um, saying that they were going to be burned in hell for their use of rouge or for their luxurious, uh, you know, uh, sable mantle or whatever. And so they were collecting these items. They basically terrorized their neighbors to get these items to be burned. Um, so it was a real bullying technique. And as Savonarola goes along, and once that threat of uh, the French, you know, um, scourge is kind of gone, um, we start to see more and more pushback against his type of preaching, against the tenets he's espousing. Um, he doesn't really know how to um, formulate this new government. Um, and uh, we have, again, wealthy families that had hoped that when the Medici were gone, they could come to power. And so they're kind of pushing back against him. So there was a lot of pushback on um, Savonarola. And I do see a question in the chat, and I'll get right to that. Um, also, uh, after his execution, uh, the... Um, the, the church and uh, really tried to stamp out any of his followers. And in fact, there was a great censure done against the monastery of San Marco. Uh, and instead, the other Dominican monastery, um, which was more lenient um, and more in line with the papacy, uh, ended up kind of getting promoted above San Marco. And that was the monastery at uh, Santa, Maria, Santa Maria Novella, which was another Dominican monastery. Um, so we really do see an active pushback by the Florentines themselves, and then we later see a pushback by the papacy and the uh, um, to kind of stamp out or try to quell this renewal of interest in him after his execution. And the renewal in particular really rises to prominence uh, in the third and final expulsion of the Medici from Florence, um, because the Medici come back to Florence in uh, 1512, uh, because basically um, they, uh, one of Lorenzo the Magnificent's, uh, is it Lorenzo? Yeah, one of Lorenzo the Magnificent's uh, younger sons actually becomes uh, Pope Leo X. And so um, he basically reclaims Florence, right? Um, but they'll get expelled again uh, from 1527 uh, to 1530. Um, and during that time, all of a sudden, we see a kick up of uh, manuscripts by Savonarola being published again. Um, so let me just check the chat really quickly here. Um, so are there any current readings we can find to learn more about Savonarola? Um, yes, I have entire uh, books about them. I have many, many books about Savonarola behind me. One of the best ones is by a gentleman, and I'll send this to Elisa and Katie, and they can possibly send it out to everybody. Uh, it's a gentleman, Stefano Dal Aglio. Um, he's Italian. Uh, he's actually, or when he wrote this, he was a, a fellow at the Medici Archive Project in Florence. And this book, Savonarola and Savonarolianism, is a really good text. I would also recommend that you reach, read, excuse me, uh, Di Donald Weinstein's volumes. He's written many of them on Savonarola. Mm -hmm. uh, he's kind of the um, I believe he's still alive. And when I was doing my dissertation, he was, and he was kind of the living expert on Savonarola and had done some research at the Bridwell Library as well. Um, so yes, there are many, many um, fantastic volumes on Savonarola that I would recommend. Oh, something else. Uh, I was interested in the symbolism and mnemonic aids, and I'm wondering if any of that has carried over to modern times and popular culture. 
designer, my husband's favorite designer is Robert Graham, but he is not fond of the skulls the designer puts on many pieces. Yes, neither am I. Uh, never understood them. There seems to be many skulls in jewelry. Maybe that is some sort of carryover. Well, yes, I would hazard to guess that that is a reference to a memento more. A memento more was a remembrance of death. Uh, again, that's why I say that when Savonarola told them to have an image of death carved, it was most likely that of a small skull, a small human skull. Um, and a memento mori serves to remind us that uh, from dust we came and from dust we shall return, right? To use a biblical adage there. Um, so it's most likely that these designers are kind of tapping in on that. Um, but it's also become a vogue with the younger generation, because I do teach, you know, college, um, to have kind of skull and crossbones on just about everything, um, like pins, backpacks, t-shirts. Um, so it is also something that is popular in today's culture as well and fashion. Um, but the mnemonic devices were actually, and this is uh, an extensive part of my dissertation that I didn't talk about, but mnemonic devices were actually um, used by the Dominicans to teach their novices um, how to remember to say certain um, prayers in certain orders. And uh, there was, uh, they, they really did look to memory practices such as memory palaces, um, where you're supposed to put things that you remember, that you need to remember in a virtual palace in your mind. And then you walk from room to room. And when you see what you put there that you're supposed to remember, then you can remember, say, the Hail Mary here, walk into the kitchen. Oh, there I put the Our Father, say the Our Father. And so um, my research um, showed that the Dominicans actually used these mnemonic devices extensively. And the Aldo Brandini family had a connection to the youth group, the male youth groups, the Giovanni of Florence. And so um, that's why I think they would have commissioned a mnemonic device. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And mnemonic devices are certainly used today. I'm working with one, a former student who's now a graduate um, because during my classes, she would do little drawings to help her remember things like uh, the Venus on the half shell or uh, a, the Madonna in a martini glass to reference something I had said about Simone Martini. And so we are now, um, she's illustrating it and I'm helping her write this book um, that's going to hopefully help other lovers of art history be able to have these mnemonic devices to remember things. That sounds like a really exciting project. Do keep yeah. us posted. I, yeah, we I had to. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, we had to shelve it recently because she's gotten a really big commission from like the Disney Corporation. So, oh, well, good for her. Yes, yes. Many of my students, my students graduate into jobs with salaries that I could only dream of. <laughs> Very humbling. <laughs> Right. I've left them speechless. I don't know if that's good <laughs> or bad. <laughs> I think good. We're very grateful, Christine, that you could join us this morning. Thank you so very much. Oh, my pleasure. I had a good time. All right. Thank you, everyone. Christine, uh, just to echo Elisa, thank you for being here and, and sharing your knowledge. Uh, we did record this session, so it Great. does take a few weeks to process. Um, and Christine and Elisa, I'll send it to you first before we make it more widely public, but uh, that will be forthcoming as well. So thank you all for coming today. And uh, Christine, thank you so much for sharing oh, your thoughts and your expertise with us. Thank you so much. You all have a good day, okay? I have to go teach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. good luck. <laughs> Goodbye, Thank everyone. You.